Uh, so welcome to our presentation for a workshop on machine learning and mechanistic modeling. I kind of lengthened it here slightly to mechanistic multi-scale modeling because one of our emphases will be the importance particularly in health and disease, which is to say for applications to medical problems for understanding things at multiple scales. Um, and of course, machine learning recently has undergone uh, something of a revolution with uh, deep learning, which uh, has now provided a variety of both tools and ideas for better understanding the brain. At the same time, uh, the CNS meeting overall has always emphasized the ideals of mechanistic multi-scale modeling with uh, simulations being done from the level of biophysics, ion channels, small scale reaction diffusion, up through subcellular, up through full cells, and up to areas of the brain, whole brain, and uh, spinal cord, and other parts of the central nervous system. So again, the emphasis on mechanism is because often we give drugs, or called pharmaceuticals, or we may do stimulation, sometimes called electroceuticals, or we may do uh, some surgery, such as a leucotomy, cutting white matter. And all this is at a relatively low level, but ends up influencing the whole brain. And how are we to scale these many levels and understand things? So here is a um, page up. The, uh, one of uh, the scale figures that I have used in the past, but very similar to a scale figures being used for many years. Uh, I think the first clear example appeared in Churchill and Sinyavsky's book, many years ago. Uh, we go from a spatial scale down to the molecular, which if one were able to do, which one is typically not able to do, the molecular dynamics would bring you down to the angstrom scale. Uh, and then as you go up, you even get a scale that goes beyond this, uh, really beyond space, into cognition. Uh, one of the things that I think makes the brain particularly interesting as opposed to other organs of the body is that in my opinion, there's really a lot of scale overlap that things that happen at the dendritic scale and happen at the cellular scale cannot be readily encapsulated to simply include in the local area network or in the column or in the area of the brain because there's so much interaction with, for example, in the neocortex stimulation coming in, both high and low uh, into apical dendrites, into basilar dendrites, and influencing the cell in very different ways. So this interplay between subcellular scale and network scale in that particular example, there are many such examples. So as I said before, healthcare really requires that we think about mechanism. We can't simply say, okay, we understand things at a very high level, uh, although it's important to understand things at a high level, and then not get into mechanism, because if you want to intervene, it's through mechanism. And I want to just introduce the terms that most people will be very familiar with, personalized and precision medicine. Personalized medicine is this person has a particular genome, has particular, in the case of the brain, experience, synaptic weightings, uh, particular uh, set point in terms of affect, depression potentially, uh, and may have particular anomalies, such as is seen in schizophrenia. And that person has to be treated individually and somewhat differently than the other patient with, let's say, depression or schizophrenia is treated. That's the most extreme and, and remains a hope. Uh, but right now, generally, the best we can do is precision medicine. So we can group subsets. And right now, for example, in schizophrenia, we would like to group subsets of schizophrenics based on how they would respond to medication, who will respond to glutamate-type medications, who will respond to dopamine-type medication, dopamine blockers, uh, who will respond to this, who will respond to that. Or to take another example, a lot of the drugs that have failed spectacularly, such as Vioxx, because it gave people heart attacks, uh, it was an anti, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, it failed because a subset of the population could not metabolize it in the same way, did not metabolize it in the same way and cause problems for that subset. So precision medicine is pick out the subset that can take this medicine, pick out the subset that can't take this medicine, pick out the subset that will benefit from a particular medicine. Um, so I've already said we're dealing with spatial scales up to the whole body. 
And when I say we're dealing from temporal scales now, and you will see here we have temporal scales down to the millisecond, which would be action potentials, up to, uh, we should have years here because uh, things, uh, development happens over 10 to 20 years, uh, development of the brain, and uh, degeneration happens over 10 to 20 years on the other end of life. Uh, but in terms of, for example, just drug treatment, uh, an example would come from Parkinson's disease, where we give Cinemet, and the Cinemet may take effect. Cinemet is a combination of L-dopa and dopamine. It's to be a, a dopamine agonist to reverse the problems with the degeneration of the substantia nigra, which is altering function in the striatum. It takes effect in a couple hours. So you say, okay, we understand that. We're going to understand that uh, pretty well with these limited temporal scale models. But over the course of 10 years, you find, uh, usually five years actually, you find decreasing efficacy. So things are changing, and things are changing in response to the constant bath of dopa, dopamine that the body and the brain is seeing. Um, so, how are we going to combine machine learning, particularly nowadays deep learning, which is uh, so powerful, and multi-scale modeling, mechanistic multi-scale modeling? Various ways to consider it. One is that deep learning can itself be used as a direct model of how the brain works, how a neural network works. And in this context, we might use uh, mechanistic modeling to better understand how mechanisms happen in what deep learning tells us about how the brain works. Uh, certainly, all kinds of machine learning, of course, makes an excellent tool for data interpretation. So that includes not only experimental data, but also the in silico data that comes out of the multi-scale models, because the multi-scale models are experimental objects. They are too complex to encapsulate in a single equation, and you end up running lots of simulations and interpreting them in the way you would interpret a rat slice or a whole rat which you're recording from. Um, machine learning can be used as a means of reducing dimensionality of one or more scales to create hybrid models, and that would allow you to then take out a scale potentially. So for example, we always take out the scale because we can't simulate it uh, of molecular dynamics. We're going to assume that ion channels behave in a certain way with voltage sensitivity, and we're not going to simulate that. And that would be uh, a, a, a very reduced scale. It wasn't developed by machine learning. It was developed by Hodgkin Huxley. Uh, and it's not only the single, uh, obviously not the single channel, it's a population of channels in that case, but we can imagine similar efforts being using uh, machine learning or deep learning as an embedded process that would give you the mapping uh, in time that such a reduced model gives. Uh, similarly, mechanistic modeling could be a way, and I think I said that before, of exploring the results from deep learning. How does this come about? What can we say by understanding better the mechanisms of the way neurons are really firing? I think as we discuss today, uh, I hope we'll find many other applications. And I'll say in a moment where we have our Google Doc, I've just seeded it with these comments here as a way of adding further things for discussion at the end of the day. <clears throat> So we have, though, a mind-brain-body problem. Uh, we, of course, want to understand all of these levels. Uh, Marr, who most people will be very familiar with, David Marr, came up with the notion that we could understand the brain by understanding the problems that it solves, then going down to an algorithmic level, then going down to an implementation level. And from his perspective, the implementation level really didn't matter because it could be silicon and it could be neurons, and it could be anything else. Uh, so in paraphrasing him, perhaps somewhat unfairly, uh, we would say he can understand the mind without understanding the brain. And I would point out, as many others have pointed out, that algorithms, uh, the second level of Mars tri triumvirate uh, triad, are non-unique. And for example, no one would have expected that vision, which is what uh, a problem that Mars in particular had interest in, would be broken up into two streams that then have to be bound back together, giving you the binding problem. The binding problem is a problem that doesn't arise until you start to solve the visual problem in this peculiar way, which is evolutionarily makes sense that you have these two needs, where and what. Uh, this kind of thinking has been most thoroughly explored, I think, in stomatic gastric ganglion by Eve Martyr and her colleagues. So down to the cellular level, Golwash has shown uh, with Eve Martyr that the 
the dynamics of the cell show non-unique solutions in terms of ion channels. And then at the network level, Astrid Prince and Eve Martyr again have shown how the solutions there are non-unique. There are many ways of getting to the same thing. And depending on where, how you get there, you have different mechanisms. And so you'll have different drug treatments and different surgical treatments and different electroceutical treatments. Uh, the other point to be made here is Edelman's notion of neural Darwinism. These are systems that are evolving, perhaps, as Edelman suggested, in the individual, as well as, of course, evolving across time in the species. Uh, another point is subsidiarization of neural control. It's always amazing how far a chicken, or as it turns out, a rat or a cat, can run without a brain. And so there's a lot that goes on at lower levels that we rarely think about because we're so neocortex focused and certainly brain focused, uh, whereas the spinal cord and brainstem are really able to do a remarkable amount. And so at every level, you've got things that can be done at that level, and then you have control from higher levels. Uh, fast and slow thinking, of course, vastly popularized by a recent book, Fast and Slow Reflexes, and some very fast responses, remarkably fast. So for example, uh, Thorpe has written about how you can identify scenes in as little as one to 200 milliseconds, and points out that a baseball player will be able to interpret where the ball is going within, well, 200 milliseconds is basically all he or she has to hit the ball. So there's really very fast responses that, again, require subsidiarization, require practice, require presumably the cerebellum, and uh, it, it, a very different system, sets of systems that are interacting in this complex way. Uh, I found a quote recently from Terry Sinyovsky, who will be speaking this afternoon. The body is more complicated than the brain to replicate. So also when you think about how uh, people work or how animals work, you have to consider the end organ. And the end organ has its own complications that the brain and the spinal cord have to take into account. So that you really have this, this full system. And of course, you know, in medicine, we always talk about holistic medicine. We're treating the whole patient uh, in terms of understanding, we also have to think somewhat holistically. And another point to be made here is that the stuff that is easy for computers to do, like higher math or now go and chess, but not that that's easy for them, but they, they do it remarkably well, is hard. Frankly, go and chess are hard for most humans. I can't play go at all. Um, I play chess extremely badly. But the things that are easy for animals to do, such as a house fly to fly around and uh, evade, capture, and mate, and feed, are very hard for a supercomputer to do. So I think there are diff very different algorithms, very different implementations, and those implementations in part are giving rise to very different algorithms that are being used. And I don't think that's a, by itself a controversial statement. So what are we doing today? Well, we'll start in the morning. In five minutes uh, with my colleague and co-organizer, Sam Nemoten, who will talk, talk about reinforcement learning in the context of a couple different visuospatial tasks. Uh, then after that, we'll hear from Gunnar Sedersund talking about uh, much higher level thinking about health and treatment of disease with the whole body involved, that, that point we just made, but here talking about maybe even different systems, so hormonal systems, immune system, all interacting. Uh, and eventually, one would like to think about your, uh, your, your biome and how your gut biome is interacting with your brain. There's a lot of crosstalk, a lot of influences. Uh, then Danilo Jok, I practice this, um, is going to talk about precision psychiatry, again, precision medicine compared to personalized medicine, where precision is take a group of people and try to understand them separately. Then Daniel Durstowitz, again, a psychiatry talk here, deep learning. Uh, then we have a lunch break. We did have one cancellation, so the lunch break will be a little bit long, which I'm sure no one will object to. And I, I assumed we'll be running over a little, so I put that at about 1,300, 1 o'clock. This is all Eastern U.S. time, uh, and so you have to correct if you're elsewhere. In our afternoon, uh, my afternoon, uh, Thomas Serre will present on circuits to deep learning in vision. So there's this tie-in, tying together some of the circuitry issues, uh, which would be mechanistic to the deep learning, which would be a machine learning algorithm. 
Uh, after that, Terry Sinyavsky will talk about the temporal dynamics in a particular inhibitory, excitatory network in uh, a working memory. And Kenji Doya, finally, will talk about multi-scale data assimilation from the many scales that people do experiments at. Uh, finally, we'll end up with a discussion, and I hope as many people can will join in, not just the people who presented. Um, and so for the discussion, I, uh, we, uh, Sam and I, have set up a Google Doc that will let you add points and questions and potentially additional little chats, uh, pieces of chats. Uh, you can add to that. And of course, you're not going to copy this down, which is why it says dot, dot, dot. I will now copy that address into our chat. So for those who are not familiar with this format, we do have a chat room where we can say little things. And then we have a separate question room where we can ask questions that will be addressed to the speaker or make comments. And uh, so that's two different chats. And then this document in Google will be a third type of chat. Uh, so let me hand it over at this point to uh, Sam Nemoten. He works at uh, NKI, which is the Nathan Klein Institute. And his title is not readily found by me. So he will tell you his title. All right. So uh, uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, so I'll share the screen now and hopefully it'll work a bit. Okay. Entire screen. So, so is that all visible now? Screen. Uh, can you hear also? I hear you. Whoops. And the screen is uh, the slides are visible. I hear you, but I don't think I see your slides. I'm trying to get rid of my sharing. Uh, wait, something came up. Yes, your your screen has come up. Okay, so. I'll Get started then. Great. Okay, thanks. So the topic is using reinforcement learning to, to train biophysically detailed models of the visual motor cortex to play Atari games. So that's the visual spatial uh, task that Bill was uh, talking about. So, um, so just an outline of uh, the topics that I'll go through here. So first I'll just briefly uh, give an overview of some of the deep reinforcement learning algorithms that are used. And uh, then I'll go to the biologically pl more biologically plausible reinforcement learning algorithms and show how they can be used to train uh, network sensory motor cortex networks to control arms to reach towards targets, uh, stationary targets, and then go on to more dynamic environments in the video game setting where we train visual motor cortex to play the games. So uh, deep reinforcement learning, of course, has very impressive performance at state of the art and specific behaviors and computational tasks, including game playing, like Bill mentioned in, in the game of Go. And it became kind of famous when they trained these deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning networks to play the Atari games using just the pixels, basically, and then a feedback signal. And they've also been used a lot recently for object recognition. So Google image search, for example, uses some of these deep learning algorithms. But uh, they do have certain problems. So one of them is that they require huge uh, training exam huge database of training examples and pretty demanding hardware infrastructure. So it's not always so simple to run these algorithms. And that, that suggests that they might not be as efficient as they could be. That could be a hardware issue, but it could also be an algorithm issue itself. Um, so there, there could be room to improve some of these algorithms. And they also use some biologically unproven learning rules, uh, which are somewhat controversial, whether, whether, they, whether they exist in biological systems and in the brain, like error propagation and stochastic gradient descent. So those are the, the, the traditional algorithms that are that have been used for these deep learning algorithms. And uh, another problem is that the networks that they use, they have uh, pretty simplified neurons that, that don't even include spike time. So that makes it difficult to compare against experimental data that's recorded uh, from animals, for example. And then that will limit potentially limit insights into how uh, short time scale activity in the brain is contributing to perception and behavior. And this figure over here is showing 
Uh, let me see how to get the point to it. Uh, it's just showing how the computing power and hardware uh, demands from re uh, deep learning algorithms has increased over time and kind of outstripped where, where they need to be. So some more work on improving algorithms could, could give uh, more efficient results possibly. So uh, this is a figure that you've seen probably recently from some of the talks here at the CNS meeting. So this is a, from a paper in 2015 where they trained this uh, deep network to play these Atari games. And so, so the, the question that's motivating some of this work is what's missing in these uh, networks and models. So one thing is that the neurons are, are kind of simplified. They're just these uh, rectified linear units. So they integrate the in inputs, but they don't have uh, realistic temporal dynamics and they don't emit uh, action potentials. So they have less precision in terms of their spiked, in terms of their temporal integration and out input and output processing. And the circuits tend to be somewhat simplified too, where they generally use feed forward architectures, which lack recurrent and feedback connectivity, which is kind of a, a critical uh, feature of the of the brain, where a lot of, uh, there, where there's a lot of top down connectivity important for a different uh, computational uh, tasks and so on. And again, the learning algorithms tend to be simplified, which are questionable biologically. So a uh, recent paper was looking at trying to add a little bit of realism to these kinds of architectures for the game playing tasks. So they took an artificial neural network in ANN, they trained it with gradient descent, and then they converted the neuron units into these spiking neurons. And they had this uh, algorithm for converting the weights so that they would be appropriately scaled. But then the outcome was that there was some degradation in performance, but there were also some benefits in terms of robustness to visual occlusion in, this, in the game scenes that are presented to the model. So this is a kind of a hybrid approach. And then on the other side, we have these data-driven biophysical neural circuit models, which have really taken off because there's a lot of data sharing and they've been developing for, for many decades. And this is an example of uh, of an auditory thalamocortical circuit model, which we've been using to start to investigate the role of brain rhythms in auditory and speech processing. And you can build a lot of rich biological detail into these models. For example, there's many different cell types, many interneuron types and different types of uh, pyramidal cells and their connectivity patterns are all determined based on uh, anatomical, electro electrophysiological and circuit mapping data. So there's really a lot of complexity in these models and they're all constrained using this uh, uh, data from experiments. And once you have these uh, detailed circuit models, then that, that adds computational power compared to the simplified uh, artificial neural networks. So for example, this is a this is a dendritic, this is a layer five pyramidal cell from motor cort from mouse motor cortex. Uh, and this is the reconstruction. So you see these uh, giant den dendritic trees and they can integrate spatio-temporally varying stimuli much more complicated than what you can process with, uh, with the point neuron that's uh, typically used in these ANs. So each neuron ends up being like a network. And another benefit of these models is that they allow you to compare signals uh, to experimental data at perceptual time scale. So this is showing uh, from that uh, auditory model this is spiking activity from different neurons. This is a raster plot. And then this is uh, current source density from laminar electrode rays recorded from non-human primates. And then we uh, actually can now simulate this using the same, the same electrode configuration. And then that allows you to compare how the signals in different cortical layers are co contributing to input and output and information processing. And another important feature of these kinds of models with the excitatory and inhibitory neurons is that when you have interneurons with different time scales, uh, synapses with different time scales, that contributes to different uh, rhythms. So that's kind of a, a major theme in these uh, neural ne neuronal network simulations where you have these slow and fast oscillations and they're coupled in time and, and the low frequency can modulate the faster frequency. So that can contribute to different uh, information processing, which is also lacking in the artificial neural networks. So, uh, so, so the motivation for this work was to use more realistic microcircuits and cell types to first provide insight into biological uh, dynamics and their contributions to functions, so oscillations, spike time, and synchrony, and intracellular dynamics. It's, so by using modeling, you can 
you can uh, better understand how they contribute to function in this uh, game setting because the games provide controlled setting to study the contribution of specific dynamic features in learning and behavior. So that was the main motivation for this. And then we want to see if we can use neuroscience to uh, improve the engineering algorithms like the deep learning networks. And, and that's a kind of more of a long-term goal. So, so the first example of using this kind of architecture with uh, neuron, uh, more detailed neurons, is learning these sensory motor transforms. So this was a model from uh, well, almost 10 years ago, uh, back in 2012. So we, we built this model of multiple areas, and we were trying to train it to, this is a sensory motor cortex model, and we were trying to train to, con to control a virtual simulated arm to reach towards a target. And this is a fixed target here. So we used um, spike timing dependent reinforcement learning rule, and uh, that was uh, that which takes a global error signal. So basically, initially, the model is uh, set up with random weight, and then it produces these uh, movements, which are kind of stochastic, and that's called motor babbling. And then over time, when the arm moves towards the target, then the synapses which were recently activated get reinforced, and the ones which contribute to the wrong movements are punished, and they, they get weakened. So over time, um, this learning rule, spike timing dependent reinforcement learning, can contribute to the proper behavior. So this shows the, the rule in a little bit more detail. So. So the spike timing dependent part is when the presynaptic neuron fires, then the postsynaptic neuron fires within a short time window, then that synapse is tagged. And then there's an eligibility trace, which is activated. And then later on, when, when the behavior is assessed, so that could be from the dopaminergic reward system. So the reward and punishment signals will reinforce or punish that, that synapse based on the behavioral, behavioral outcome. So uh, we could model it in a lot more detail, looking at intracellular mechanisms like calcium-dependent signaling, but this is just kind of a phenomenological model that we're using here. And so it is effective in training that, ne that network architecture I showed. So this shows the starting location of the 2D arm, which we're training, and this is the target location. So after uh, a long period of training, so the arm is uh, act, uh, the network is able to control the arm to reach towards the target. You can train it on different targets. And then compared to the naive network, this is the error uh, in the movement. So the naive network, which doesn't have any training, stays basically at a high level of error, but the trained model is able to uh, uh, reach towards the target that it was trained for. So that shows um, kind of a, a first case that was effective in, this, in using this paradigm to train these models. And then uh, once we have the network that was trained, we can look at the dynamics and try to understand what it contributes to function. So this show, this top part here shows a raster plot of the different neural, neural populations and their firing times. And it shows the naive network without training and after training, so there's a lot more synchrony in the population uh, activity. And that could contribute to more effective uh, activation of the muscles uh, that simulated output from the motor population which controls the movements. And then we also looked at the information transfer between different populations, so that was increasing too. So these uh, circles here are the different populations in the model. So ES is the sensory neurons, EM is the motor excitatory neurons, I is for the interneurons. So before training, the, the, the dashed lines represent the information, uh, the strength of the information flowing between the populations and the solid lines are uh, after training. So there, there's uh, certain populations increase their information transfer. So it, for example, the uh, sensory neurons increase the transfer of information to the motor population. So that suggests that the sensory information is being used more effectively to drive the output. And this is another example from, from a more detailed model, which was developed by, uh, by our colleagues and um, so they so use this detailed model of motor cortex to train this uh, more detailed musculoskeletal arm model and a robotic arm model in the real world to uh, reach towards a target and they used different targets. And by using this more detailed circuit model, we can uh, generate hypotheses and predictions on uh, what each cortical layer is contributing in terms of the uh, uh, computations. So, um, so that video there showed um, after training that the arm, both the simulated and the robotic arm, are able to reach towards the target. And so, uh, yeah. 
So uh, then we wanted to scale up this kind of architecture to uh, a more complex behavior in a more dynamic environment. So, so that's the video game environment where things are changing and moving around. And you have to use more predictions basically on uh, uh, where the ball is going. So this is the Pong game. So you have two paddles. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with Pong. But the idea is it's basically a 2D version of tennis. So you have to hit the ball to the other side and get it past the opponent. And then you get a point. And so this, this was an Atari game that was trained with the deep learning architectures that I mentioned in the beginning. But then we wanted to see if we can use the same kind of architecture that I showed in, in the more realistic neuron models and uh, biologically plausible learning rules. So there are these time varying inputs that are projected to a thalamic model, for example, that can go to a visual cortex model, which goes to a motor cortex. And then the uh, error signal is used to train the synapses, basically. So this is just a schematic. And then the architecture we ended up building uh, was a, ended up being more complicated. So at the early stages of processing, there's a retinal uh, area, which basically is a topographic arrangement of inputs and, and the pixels are uh, when they have a high intensity. So that drives the retinal cells to fire and that projects to a thalamic area, which has topographic uh, uh, architecture too. And then there's these interneurons there, which provide feedback inhibition. And then the thalamic uh, circuit projects to visual V1, so we modeled it with the uh, different excitatory neurons and interneurons, which take topographic inputs. And then there are these direction selective neurons as well. So each of these, uh, each of these patches uh, processes input in a, when, when there's movement in a specific direction. Uh, so by using the, the topographic arrangement, then we can detect movement directions at any pixel location basically and then all of this information all this visual information is projected to motor area which has specific motor populations which uh, produce movements in specific directions so the paddle is going to go either up down or or, or stationary and all of these synapses between the, the visual areas and the motor areas are uh, are tuned through learning using the spike time independent reinforcement learning rule which is loosely based on the dopaminergic reward system. And uh, the neurons in this model are compartment, simplified compartmental models. So they have spike times, they have ion channels, and they have more realistic synapses, which allows more realistic dynamics to emerge compared to the uh, commonly used deep learning algorithms. So uh, one of the first stages in the processing is that we have to do this image processing to extract the movement directions. So we do a thresholding on the, uh, on the input image, which is uh, from the game environment. And after that, uh, we, we find the object basically uh, by thresholding the image and then getting the pixels with high intensity and then finding their boundaries. And then uh, in successive frames, you can calculate the movement directions. And then at each pixel, you have a movement direction. So that's shown here. These are, this is not this is an untrained network. It's just showing that the uh, uh, movement directions are detected accurately. And you could also use other optical flow algorithms and that will work pretty well too. But this, is, this gives a little bit more precision to the uh, pixel to where the movements are occurring. And then for the reward paradigm, so uh, there's different ways you can implement reward, uh, reward and punishment in the model. So you can either use just the points that the game, that the Atari game gives you, and that that kind of reward works, but it's a little bit more sparse in terms of how often it occurs in time, and so it could take longer to train these models. So to uh, allow the models to learn more quickly and to accelerate the learning process, we used uh, intermediate rewards. So we provide rewards when the paddle moves towards the ball, for example, or towards the location where it'll intercept the, the paddle's Y location, uh, where, where it'll cross, cross the right side of the screen, basically. So that will be where when the paddle moves towards that target, location then will give a reward a reward for the synapses which were recently activated when it moves away from it then it'll get punished and we can also use other intermediate rewards and um, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in detail here so this shows the target trajectory reward paradigm so this shows the ball going to the left that's the AI player and this red location here is where 
the ball will intercept on the right side. So we can train the model to move towards that location dynamically. And that will allow the, the learning to accelerate more quickly and to take less time to train the, the full model. And uh, okay, so, th so another reward paradigm we use is the hit miss paradigm. So when the, when the ball comes close to the paddle, if the paddle moves away from the ball, then, and the opponent ends up getting the score, uh, then we punish the model. But if the ball hits the ball, then, then you can reward it. And sometimes it takes a few volleys to get uh, a point. So this is, that's why we consider it an intermediate reward. So it doesn't necessarily lead to a, a, an official point in the Atari game, but this could allow the model to learn intermediate signals. So we call this teacher-based reinforcement learning because we're instrumenting the model to have uh, more intermediate rewards, which is kind of like a guided system. And then after a lot of training, then we can look at the performance. So this shows the learning curve for these different measures from the model that I, that I was describing. So this is the follow target uh, score basically over time. So uh, over a long period of training, the, the performance improves a lot and also the hit miss uh, score improves a lot. And uh, so, so that's when the ball comes to the paddle and it hits it versus moving away from it. So that, that score is improving a lot too. And the score miss is how many points basically compared to the opponent is, is, the, is our model getting. So it's improving too over time. And we probably need to run it for a lot longer in order to win, but this is just showing a proof of concept that the system basically works. And uh, another thing which is an issue in these more detailed models is that uh, if you just let the weights grow, continuously, then you're going to have problems with hyperexcitability and epileptic activity. So we had to implement this uh, weight normalization rule, where every so often um, the weights are scaled down. So the pattern of weights is preserved, but, but um, the average weight is uh, just uh, uh, set down. So that's shown here that the weights are increasing. This is without normalization. This is with normalization. So periodically, the weights are just scaled down to prevent this hyperexcitability. And we also found that the, hy the hyperexcitability uh, is degrading the performance. So uh, similar in epilepsy, you can see uh, problems in motor control and other cognitive deficits sometimes. Uh, so this is, um, this is showing the learning, the learning rates. Basically, when we normalize the, mo the weights, this is the red trace, so the performance is improving su substantially and versus when we don't normalize the weight, so then the performance is a lot lower. And if we run it for a lot longer, then you'll see uh, bigger differences too because the epilepsy and hyperexcitability will develop and then the neurons won't fire properly or uh, be able to process the sensory information properly. But there's still an issue of how often to schedule this weight normalization. Uh, it has to be at the right time because if you do it too frequently, the weights will decrease and the learning won't be uh, uh, won't set into the network properly. So uh, another uh, thing that we saw that once we have the training done, then we can look at the weights for specific populations. So these uh, these different colored lines here show the weights, the average weights to specific neurons. And uh, I mentioned before that there were three populations of neurons in this architecture. So the we call them the left population, the right population, and the stay population. So they, they contribute to, uh, sorry, the up, down, and stay population. So the up population moves the paddle up, down population moves the paddle down, and the stay population holds the paddle still. And what we found was that the weights to the up and down populations were increasing faster and to higher levels than the stay populations. And that's because the stabilizing population uh, only is active when the, when the paddle happens to be at the exact location where the paddle needs to be and where, where the ball is moving towards it. So it's still a useful population in command to, to prevent the, the paddle from moving away from the target location, but, uh, but it's less likely that it'll happen to be in the right location. Uh, and then the firing rates of those populations are, are, are reflecting the weights. And these show, this shows the uh, membrane potential of different, po uh, different neurons in the raster plot. So you see these kind of synchronous patterns of activation and up here is the motor populations, which also shows show some synchronous activation too, which could be useful for driving the activation. So, so that's just to contrast to the uh, more uh, traditional deep learning algorithms where you can't measure these features and then you can't compare them to the biological data in these different tasks. And now I'll show videos of the trained models. So on the left is the AI player, on the right is the 
trained model. So this just so shows a segment of the activity where the model was performing well, and this uh, and it hits the ball and it uh, scores a point, and then and then it uh, after a few volleys, it uh, also is returning the ball. Um, and this shows the activation in different cortical layers in populations. So this is the retinal populations. Here you can see brief activation uh, with topographic information, which is then projected to the excitatory uh, neurons in V1, which have the topographic arrangement. And then this shows the direction selected neurons. These are the movement directions detected, which closely matches the movements in the video. And then over here is shown the different motor uh, populations. This is the up motor population, the down motor population, and the stay motor population. And we also have an interneuron population there, which is uh, providing uh, feedback inhibition to the motor population to prevent runaway and a, a epileptic kind of activity. So uh, just showing that you can measure the activity at a fine grain temporal scale uh, over short intervals. So this is 20 millisecond binning to generate these activity plots basically. And you can show, and, and it just demonstrates in action that the model can produce the right behaviors after training. So in, uh, in conclusion, we can use these closed loop models of the sensory motor and visual cortex to learn behaviors in the dynamic environments, just using these uh, spike time independent reinforcement learning rules, which have more, uh, which are more plausible, plausible from a biological perspective. And we're also able to use uh, uh, intermediate teacher guided rewards to accelerate the learning. So in the long run, these kinds of models could provide potential alter alternatives to the commonly used deep learning algorithms. And additionally, they offer insight into the biological processes. Uh, and when we build in more of the biological details, so this was a proof of concept basically that we can train these kinds of biophysical circuit models to perform appropriate behaviors. And when we add more, uh, realistic circuits. So for example, the kinds of models we were developing for the auditory system, we could uh, test specific parts of the, com uh, of the circuit and see how they contribute to behavior in the thalamocortical system. And uh, eventually we want to look at human and non-human primate and other animal data during uh, behavioral tasks and see how specific circuit elements contribute to the behavior. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge the funding. So uh, this work was made possible by the Army Research Office primarily for this work. And some of the circuit modeling uh, for the auditory system was from uh, NIH grant. And I, I wanted to thank the, uh, all the people who contributed to this work in different ways. There, there were a lot of people in different times. So thank you. And here's the bibliography. Thank you, Sam. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, how much time does the training take and what hardware? So uh, we are able to run the training on uh, a standard workstation, which has, uh, well, it's kind of a high power workstation. What we could use is about 30 cores or so. And it takes uh, a couple of days to run when we use, uh, when we parallelize the model. So that the models were created in the NetPine platform with the neuron simulator. So that allows you to parallelize the models pretty easily. And then, yeah, so it takes a couple of days at least to get the results with 30 cores. Uh, does the training include functional plasticity, changing synapse weights, as well as structural plasticity, adding and removing synapses? So right now we don't have structural plasticity, but we start out the, uh, with a pretty high connection density, and we randomize the initial weights with uh, pretty high variance. That, that, that ends up helping. And so because of the high variance, some of the synapses end up being not useful. So they can get basically set to close to zero weight. So that's similar to structural plasticity. And it's simpler to model than adding synapses and removing synapses during the simulation. But that would be interesting to try later on. OK, uh, another question was whether you have a potential for really a direct comparison with the other successful program, the deep learning program of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, NIH et al., um, 2015? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, source code online which we're planning to use to compare, uh, <laughs> compare the performance. Well, right now, the performance isn't at the level of the deep learning algorithms. And one of the reasons for that is that we don't have the hardware infrastructure that the people who ran those algorithms have. Uh, and we are running them, these, al th these models pretty much continuously. So they are improving, but we have to run them for a lot longer probably and uh, work out some 
some details of the algorithm to get a, a little bit better performance uh, before we compare. But we, we would like to compare to those deep learning algorithms, yes, for sure. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Gunnar Sedersund from uh, Linköping University in Sweden. And uh, he will speak on the topic of um, multi-level modeling of the brain from intracellular signaling and neurovascular coupling to whole body crosstalk and clinical implementations. Uh, Gunnar, are you able to share your screen there? Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? I hear you, I need yes. To? Okay. Very good. Uh, so I don't know where, where is the share screen? I didn't find it yet. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I think you have to hover over something, probably hover over your over own, you. over yourself. Is that right, Sam? Hover over myself. Ah, uh, maybe here. Uh, let's uh, see, share screen. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Is it working? Do you see my screen now? Uh, I see uh, you are screen sharing. Sam, did you release your screen? Uh, yeah, let me try that. Maybe I'll shut my video to make sure that, that it stops my sharing. Let me see. Okay, so let's try again, Gura. Okay. And yeah, now something else happened. Let's see. Uh, share screen. Uh, allow. Oh no, it doesn't work. Uh, I'm using a wrong, um, uh, wrong, 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 wrong. You have to click uh, on the um, <clears throat> when it, when you start with share screen, you then have to click on your picture and then click on share so yeah uh, i did it but it seems like you can't use firefox and i'm using firefox i'm <laughs> turning this over about this odd anyone been in one of these meetings before who knows how to do it they can come to come on the chat or if sam do you know okay let's Open the same in another. Uh, copy. Uh, Hi. So, so uh, you're having trouble with the sharing screen now, still? No. Or? Should you yeah. this instead? Let's see. Let me see. Uh, So it might be a Chrome issue someone's suggesting. Well, he said he was on Firefox. I would have, would have thought it would work with the major browsers. Oh, I think I did have, we did have one more question for you, Sam, actually, that I didn't see in time. So I'll present that to you meanwhile. Um, do you add stochasticity in the neuron types for the decision making? Whoops. Did you hear that, Sam? Are you muted or am I muted? Sam is muted, apparently. Okay, I unmuted you, Sam. Oh, okay. Yeah, so right now there's no stochasticity in the output con control. 
but there is a there is an option that we have for adding noise to the synapses, which we haven't uh, which we haven't found too effective right now. But, I mean, there's there's randomness in the initial wiring of the network, so that contributes to some kind of stochasticity in terms of the behavior and dynamics, but not explicit randomness in terms of the motor output encoding. Okay, so I have Gunnar back. Sam, now you can mute yourself, I think. And Gunnar, I'm now seeing your screen, I think, but I'm not hearing you or seeing you. Should we consider moving to a different talk and then coming back to Gunnar? Yeah. Uh, who's the next person? Is Danilo Chuck available? Actually, he wouldn't be able to answer me uh, because I haven't put him on, so I guess I can put him on. Oh, there's Gunnar again. Oh, we might have had him. Are you having any luck, Gunnar? Should we save you for Maybe. one? And, should we save you for one and uh, then come back to you? Yeah, maybe. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you, but I don't now. I don't see your screen. Uh, but you saw my screen before. <laughs> before I saw the screen, but I didn't hear you. Uh, this is so weird. So, uh, is there a way to focus on on him now? On on Gunnar? Oh, Danilo. Okay. So, do we want to let let's have uh, Danilo speak and then come back to you, Gunnar? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so uh, Danilo Chuk uh, speaking on algorithmic analytics towards precision psychiatry. Yeah. Now let's we'll so, see if, uh, if Danilo can, can share screen. screen. Now you have to unshare. If I click here, there's four simultaneous screens and says I can't do sharing. So one of you needs to log off, it appears. 
Yeah, so, so if you, uh, Bill, if you close uh, Gunnar, then that should, that yeah, should work. Uh, and I'll close myself, too. Don't do that, Sam, because I depend on you. Okay. <laughs> so now, is that any better, Danilo? Okay. Ah, Can that everybody better. see okay. my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Progress. changing. Okay, perfect. So what's the timeline? 30, including questions or without questions? Including questions, yes. Okay. But uh, it's okay. It's okay. All Go right. on. <laughs> so my name is uh, Dino Stark. Um, I'm a medical doctor by training with a dual background in uh, systems neuroscience and uh, machine learning statistics. And currently serving as associate professor McGill's faculty of medicine. And we are bridging the uh, activities there with emerging machine learning solutions um, through my second affiliation, which is Mila Quebec AI Institute. And so the following, what I will try to do is to provide a bird's eye view over landscape of quantitative modeling solutions and how they relate to um, the goals and ambitions that we have uh, in our path towards precision psychiatry. Um, one of my favorite slides is this one here, which tries to portray some of the important statistical developments over the last decades. And um, it is compelling to be cognizant of the fact that most of the quantitative technologies that we are using on an everyday basis in brain imaging, they actually emerged be in what is blue here before Second World War, before electronic calculators were invented. And um, this is really things like t-tests, ANOVA, chi-square, Pearson correlation, um, and null hypothesis testing with p-values. So it was really after Second World War and the second part of the 20th century that a lot of the methodologies that we today may call machine learning, deep learning, for example, that those emerged. And that's things like cross-validation procedures, which provide a different but similar approach to deriving rigorous conclusions from data, uh, which is not equivalent to null hypothesis testing, but also things like uh, penalized linear regression, or in high dimensions, as some people call it, linear aggression. Um, Bootstrap emerged as um, a very universal tool to assess statistical accuracy in a lot of different modeling settings, up to all the way to random forest, which emerged only in 2001, and the rise of deep learning perhaps around 2010. So one way to summarize this is the biggest difference between pre and post-war statistical practice is maybe the degree of automation, up to a point where today, almost all topics of the 21st century are very much computer dependent. So um, what these changes, I alluded to this before, in the quantitative toolkits that we use it doesn't only change kind of what programs we do. Um, it may actually change something more fundamental on an epistemological level. And that is what types of rigorous conclusions we can actually make based on data. So what you see here is uh, simulation results from a so-called fake data simulation study where we looked at gene expression type of data. And on the left, you see a bunch of gene expressions that are analyzed with classical statistics and the most common way to generate p-values of this type of data. And on the y-axis, you see which genes come up as relevant. If we analyze the exact same data with a tool that is maybe prototypical for the machine learning community, random forests, that's in panel B, then you see that some of the genes are the same, but they are not exactly the same importances as we see in panel A. So if we overlap this in panel C, then we can see that classical statistical inference based on p-values um, and a more prediction-based cross-validation estimate type of conclusion, um, here exemplified by the random forest, they do not give you the same type of answer. And so, the kind of intermediate summary up to this point is, um, yes, we went through an increasing automation towards tools with always more parameters, 
that take always longer to compute, as we heard in previous talks. Um, but they may also become always more um, inscrutable because there are so many model parameters. Our notions of interpretability are likely to change. And um, the categories of conclusions may not may, may, may be non identical to the ones that we made in the 20th century, where we were very focused on activities revolving around attaching p values to single input variables. So if we take this to a broader level, then what you see here is more than 100,000 different potential data sets that we generated um, by systematically varying a lot of the factors that we typically care about in everyday data analysis. That's how many, how much correlation do we observe between a set of input variables? How much noise do we have? How many variables are actually relevant to predict a certain outcome? Um, how many um, data points do we have given the number of observation uh, variables and so on and so forth? So we are systematically varied. All these factors of um, 100,000 data sets where we knew the target prediction. And what we see on the left here is each dot is really what is the best possible p value that you could get on a given data set? And what is the best out of sample prediction accuracy on the y axis for that same data set? So the point is there's a non identical relationship between the most common ways to do null hypothesis testing and PVOs in, in linear predictive models here. And using a same modeling solution to try to generalize to new data points drawn from the same distribution, which you see on the y-axis. So we can zoom in into a space that we typically care about um, based on p-values that's on the right side here. And um, you can easily see that um, it is much easier across all these data sets and data analysis scenarios to obtain at least one statistically significant result. But um, these same models showed a drastic variation in how well they explain variation in new data points drawn from the same distribution. So if you put it on its head, it is much easier to, to get statistically significant results, but they're not always predictive. Whereas if you establish predictive relationships such as by cross-validation type of procedures in a linear model class, then um, those most of the time will also give you statistically significant results. So if you now think that all these were just uh, made up data and we tweaked it in some way, here's just a very quick slide from four common data set from textbook statistics uh, sources, data sets that have been analyzed again and again over the last 20 to 30 years. And we show that uh, across common data sets from the biomedical space, that all combinations of statistically significant and successful prediction are possible, right? So in a given data set, most of the time in a given research project, we usually just have one data set. And then so in a given data set, all combinations of finding significance but not predictability, predictability but not significance, and so on, are possible. So in the following, and that's the second of three parts in this uh, talk, I will, I will come in and say that um, I will make the argument that classical null hypothesis testing, as we have been practicing in the 20th century and which was an important ingredient for 20th century evidence-based medicine and it's responsible for a lot of forward progress in medicine, and including psychiatry and neurology. In the following, I'll make 10 different arguments why um, establishing um, p-values and significant relationships is mis probably misaligned with the, many of the goals that we have in precision psychiatry and computational psychiatry. So one first result uh, uh, citation is this one here from the 70s, actually a philosopher. So inferences but not prediction explain what has happened and predictions but not inferences forecast what will happen. So in my own words, this kind of means that, um, which is sometimes forgotten that um, p-value statistical significance type of inferences they very much rely on um, a criterion of optimality. 
that is not directly um, targeting uh, prediction performance in future or other data sets. So um, if you really want to put your finger on it, um, then um, p-values now are part of this test. Active type of methodology in direct comparison to cross validated machine learning types of predictions. And, and this takes us back to the historical overview that I tried to uh, uh, portray at the beginning. So um, a lot of the questions that we are asking more and more, now that we have internet scale data, now that we have the computational power to run models with millions of parameters, so um, it really just recently became possible to fit models and fit them well up to a point where we can obtain accurate predictions about quantities um, that are relevant in the future, um, including, for example, um, symptom prediction from drugs, drug repurposing strategies, or uh, treatment response prediction in psychiatry. So another aspect to emphasize again, that inference prediction are just completely different modeling paradigms in a lot of the times. On the left, you see uh, some of the uh, general and theoretical properties of classical statistics, such as um, exemplified by ANOVA p-values, uh, linear regression, and so forth. And an important uh, foundation of these quantitative tools is really um, notions like degrees of freedom, asymptomatic consistency, right? A lot of the uh, theoretical proofs, they very much rely on um, taking sample sizes to infinity theoretically. Um, and this leads to kind of like uh, invalidations of inferential processes, like double dipping, circuit analysis, and so on. And what I like to emphasize, however, is that the predictive paradigm such as exemplified by many of the tools and modeling regimes in the machine learning community, it has a completely different basis in terms of um, the theoretical pillars that really justify and um, define the boundaries of these modeling paradigms. So th those are things like Vopnik Shavu and KISS dimensions, but also probably approximately correct learning, cursive dimensionality, notions of hypothesis space. So how large is the space of modeling solutions that are potential results of a particular analysis uh, that, that the investigator conducts? And rather than um, doing a lot of mathematical proofs where the sample size is taken to infinity, there's a, a relatively larger focus and the theoretical work in this community on proofs that show guarantees as a function of increasing sample size. So long story short, um, the theoretical foundations of what justifies um, now hypothesis testing, things like t-test and over and so forth, they mostly emerged uh, before Second World War. Whereas the things that I mentioned here on the right, Vaptic shown in dimensions, but also what's not shown, probably approximately correct learning, a different theoretical frameworks, they very much emerged in the middle of the second half of the 20th century, so more like in the 70s and 80s. So the summary from this slide is again that um, making accurate predictions about single variables and potential mechanistic insight is just a different modeling agenda than trying to merely show useful, accurate predictions in new data. And that is also reflected in the theoretical foundations of these different modeling paradigms. Here, here's another quote. And um, so this is really from one of the uh, classic textbooks in classical statistical inference. And it's really on page like 300 or 400 that they say a type of inference that we have not discussed until now is prediction. Uh, so of unobserved random variates, this is a type of inference that they didn't really consider up to that point. So you can look at um, kind of thick, recognized brick textbooks that just do hardly discuss prediction to new data points. And there's a lot of reasons why this made sense um, in this modeling paradigm. 
Um, so here's the second of 10 arguments. Um, once you have a p-value, um, it is not immediately possible to take this single quantity, go to new data points or new patients or new brain scans or new genetic microarrays, and to make statements about a new data point or person that you have not observed yet, right? So one way to kind of uh, understand that is that, which you see on the left, uh, null hypothesis testing, it very much kind of uses up all your data, all the data points that you have to really come to the conclusion whether or not a particular input variable, like factor, covariate, whatever, has a relevant uh, relationship to a given outcome, such as or not. Um, in cross-validation and other resampling schemes, which you see uh, on the right, there's a different logic to it where models are um, fitted in sequence to different subsets of the data. So you have a lot of different candidate models and you leave out a certain part of the data points drawn from the same distribution that are um, independent uh, from the previous ones. And this is really what allows you to get an accurate, nearly unbiased estimate of the expected prediction performance in new data points, microarrays, patients that you may observe in the future. So here's a, a, a third point. So um, close related to the, to the previous one, um, only if you can um, apply a model to a single data point, it is also possible to, for example, design a model this year, but then deploy it next year in 2021, when a new patient enters the practice, shows his or her um, genetics, behaviors, blood uh, uh, um, profile, and so forth, and to really use that model that we built in the past to derive conclusions um, in the future. Um, another point that is um, made every once in a while is that we know since at least the 30s of the last century that p-values null hypothesis testing were not designed to scale to very large data sets. So what you see here is as the sample size increases, a Pearson correlation coefficient um, is one way to do null hypothesis testing. It actually becomes um, significant um, for always smaller uh, Pearson correlation coefficients. So one example is, uh, do you have this here? One example is uh, the UK Biobank study, one of the early ones um, in five, 10,000 people. At this sample size already, um, most Pearson correlation coefficients around 0 0.1, which most of us are taught at university at school are not that strong, they are all statistically significant even after correcting for multiple comparisons. Um, so if you, if you say it in a different way, uh, if you have thousands of data points, which we more and more often do, which we probably will require to, to approach a future of precision medicine, it will be always harder not to obtain statistically significant results. So here's another way to put it. It's commonplace among statisticians that chi-square and p-values can be viewed as a crude measure of sample size. This can be framed as a distinction between practical and statistical significance, right? So it's easy to get statistical significance in large data sets, but it's harder to get practical significance. Uh, well, let's skip this one. Here's another one, uh, 0.5. Uh, I think that is less often mentioned uh, from what I see. So uh, classical p-values, null hypothesis testing, inferential statistics as we practice in the 20th century, um, they have not been made for the high P setting. That means if you fit some model that appreciates thousands, tens of thousands of parameters, that's what we do in polygenic risk scores. That's what, what we do in what the brain imaging community calls multivariate uh, pattern analysis. Uh, P values have not been made for that. And um, here in this book, people say, we have seen that in P bigger N, more variables and observations. It's easy to obtain a user's model. There's zero residuals. Um, and their conclusion is that um, squared errors, p-values, r-square, and so forth, 
should never be used on the training data as uh, evidence for a good model fit. Uh, another one is that many of the classical statistical procedures, including ANOVA, they rely on dichotomic thinking. So for example, um, what we want more and more in computational psychiatry is really to compare many different disease categories at the same time. So not only what's the difference between healthy and schizophrenic individuals, but what's the difference between healthy, schizophrenic, bipolar, uh, depression, ADHD, and so on and so forth. But the thing is that if you look at how ANOVA, classic ANOVA, actually implements such a um, kind of multi-outcome setting, then you realize that um, there's often an omnibus type of test where you say, um, okay, is any of my target groups different from any of the other groups? Then I obtain statistical significance. So uh, there's no technical distinction between whether kind of schizophrenics are different from everybody else or every disease is different from every, any other one. So another one related to the previous point is multi-outcome modeling. So the machine learning community just has uh, so many more tools and historically uh, a much stronger emphasis on modeling paradigms where you consider several dimensions of variation at the same time. So instead of on the left comparing schizophrenia and healthy or ADHD versus healthy, um, it's more um, possible um, to just compare dozens of different lifestyle markers or aspects of disease or different facets of a clinical outcome of interest. So there's a, it's just a richer toolkit to do that. Um, also, what we see more and more is convenient samples, open data sets, uh, electronic health records, other data sets that we just happen to have and that we're not, like we do still most of the time, carefully collected in a previously planned um, well, hypothetically motivated study of a few subjects invited to the local laboratory. So more and more often, we want to combine different sources of data that we happen to have. Um, and this will more and more include, for example, uh, sensor data, um, for example. And that really raises the question, how should we actually combine all these different, very different, very kind of like, heterogeneous in nature data sets. And um, again, um, the machine learning community has probably more tools uh, on the tool belt to integrate high dimensional sources of variation into a single model estimation than many of the tools that emerge in the classic statistics community. Point nine out of 10 is similar to the previous one. Um, if we analyze more and more sensor data, open data sets, or uh, reanalyze data that were acquired for a different purpose. Oftentimes, we will look at observational data rather than controlled data. And um, there's a lot of uh, implications that make it harder to really make careful statements about disease and brain biology um, in these much more messy and much more heterogeneous data sets that were not um, perhaps acquired with the same rigor or that have much more missing data and so on and so forth. So the last point is uh, the whole space of latent factor discovery. So when we talk about um, disease subtyping, intermediate phenotypes, uh, in genetics, brain imaging, and other areas, um, I think it has a very close relation to latent factor modeling. And um, again, I think the machine learning community, uh, I mean, we have PCA since 1900, and ICA emerged in the mid 90s. Um, but um, since then, in the last 20 years, a lot happened in the latent uh, factor modeling space. And the machine learning community uh, has kind of generated many of the recent inventions that lend themselves more directly to um, disease subtyping. So two examples from my lab the, as a third part of this talk, just very quick. Um, the first one is this year. So we heard a lot of talking about deep learning and its relation to psychiatry and brain imaging. So what we started two years ago is what should still be uh, the most comprehensive assessment of the feasibility and potential hard advantages of deep learning solutions in brain imaging MRI 
in the UK Biobank. So as many of you know, the UK Biobank is the largest existing open biomedical data set at this point. And so we benchmarked um, how do uh, always more complicated models that have always better theoretical uh, potential to yield better predictions, how do they actually scale with always more subjects that's on the right in comparison to reference data sets from the machine learning community? So very quick, what you see is that on the left, an MNIST 10-class digit classification, which is one of these favorite goals that the machine learning community uh, uh, likes to use to benchmark models. You see that as you have always more data points, um, linear models are always more outperformed by kernel methods in green, which are more elaborate, capture more complicated relationships. And the kernel models, in turn, are always more outperformed by deep learning models in blue. And that's also the case in the fashion data set on the bottom left, which has a more complicated classification problem. Um, if we now turn to brain imaging data and the UK Biobank, as I mentioned, and the top right, this is structural brain data from an atlas. And on the bottom right, you have functional MRI data, so functional connectivity edges in thousands of people. And you see that not only deep learning does perform as well as kernel methods, it goes beyond that. Deep learning models cannot be reliably outperformed by linear models. So I'm talking about penalized linear regression, um, linear support vector machines, logistic regression. We do not see in 10,000 people uh, evidence that deep learning can capture exploitable nonlinear structure. So that doesn't mean that uh, deep learning is necessarily uh, useless for phenotype prediction and brain imaging data, including disease classification. But if the main goal is to achieve the best possible prediction accuracy, we find little evidence that brain imaging uh, has the granularity, has the richness of um, complicated intervariable relationships, truly make um, um, distinguishably better predictions compared to even linear models. So the last example is uh, from my lab, just this one here, just one slide. Um, so what can we do with machine learning, though, in brain imaging in relation to psychiatry? And what we did here is we uh, tried to ask the question, which types of experiments, which cognitive paradigms that we could administer to healthy subjects and patients with a diagnosis of schizophrenia are actually most promising if we are using brain imaging. So what you see here is the result of um, stacking analysis in a European cross-site data set, 500 people, where we rank in a data-driven fashion which classes of cognitive functions yield most reliable differences between healthy and schizophrenic individuals. And in the top 10, you see a lot of topics brain systems, neurocognitive systems that we have been identifying and investigating over the last decades. But there's also several of them. Several of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, done. I'm, I'm done. Um, so conclusions, I think that's most important to me personally is, um, so different statistic regimes serve distinct research goals. That's one. And that shouldn't be a matter of tradition, habit, or taste. That's my main conclusion. And I thank my collaborators for the inspiration on the left. And I thank these institutions on the right for the financial support. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh-huh. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, stop sharing. Okay, stop sharing.
Uh, okay, now, now you can hear? Okay, so thanks for the great talk. Uh, yeah, so we had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, uh, is there a process for taking old data, doing a meta-analysis that would let you divide up the population into subpopulations for precision medicine for these subgroups? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly um, clear what the exact yeah, question is. Not, not exactly um, what the exact I think question. one um, kind of um, one um, warning that that I could give from what I see in computational psychiatry and, and imaging neuroscience approaches to uh, computational psychiatry is that the more we can bind different data sets in different populations and different sites, the lower our prediction accuracy. That's just empirically what we observe, right? So all of us would like it if we can bind always different data sets and then our modeling gets better and our prediction gets always better. Unfortunately for now, for the most part, that's not what happened. Um, it is very difficult to account for uh, what some people call batch effects, so different sites that use different scanners, for example, or population differences in the types of people that are recruited, different comorbidities, and so forth. Um, handling these divergences and sources of heterogeneity on a technical and biological level of different data sets, different sites, is a major challenge. If we can get rid of those, yes, then it's great. Then we can do meta analysis. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, do people uh, in the audience know where they can ask questions? See that little button at the bottom that says "Ask a Question." In case uh, the audience didn't notice that, but uh, let me see if there's any. Uh, uh, not right now. No. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so thanks. And uh, so now we'll go to Gunnar. Um, uh, it seems like uh, I'm still having the same, uh, or I changed the the. Um, uh, the browser, but it seems like this browser doesn't work either. So uh, keep moving on in the schedule if possible. Okay, so let me see who's uh, uh, next then. Let me see who's uh, next then. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Derstowitz, let me see. Let me invite him on screen. Okay, I invited Daniel. Let me see where. Yeah, yeah, Guna, are you using a Mac? Yeah, there's some settings that you have to change for a Mac. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, Okay, so, 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 uh, so we'll have Daniel now and then, and then after we fix uh, the issues with the screen sharing for Gunnar, we'll continue uh, uh, with that. There's some comments in the audience who, uh, from people who might be able to help with that, and I'll try to look up that information too now. Okay, so, uh, so Daniel Derstowitz from CIMH Mannheim and the Bernstein Center will now uh, present. Uh, Daniel, do you have... A screen share setup? Um, yeah, but it doesn't show um, the window, the application window that I need. Um, so um, it's the same issue we had before. Um, um, okay, let me try something. Um, I'll try. Um, let me briefly try something out here. Ah, now okay, yeah. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, now we can see them. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, uh, so thanks for joining. I uh, hope you can all hear me and see my slides. I'm going to talk about our approaches for inferring uh, dynamic systems from uh, data using deep learning approaches. So speaking at a computational neuroscience science conference, I assume that you all know what a dynamic system is basically, but I uh, still want to remind you of um, the importance of dynamic systems theory in neuroscience and psychiatry first. Um, as many of you uh, will know, um, it really has a long tradition in theoretical oh. and computational uh -huh. neuroscience. Oh, sorry. Now, now we can't see the slides anymore. You can't see the slides anymore. Okay. How about now? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Um, I'll go back to the screen sharing here. It keeps, well, okay. Now? Yeah, now we can see. Okay, yeah. Don't know what's going on here, but uh, okay. Uh, let's hope for the best. So um, uh, just wanted to uh, make the point that um, uh, dynamic system theory really has a long tradition in computational and theoretical neuroscience dating back at, at least to the work of John Hopfield, uh, but likely before, uh, who, as many of you might know, conceived memory patterns as fixed point attractors and the process of memory retrieval as convergence to one of these uh, fixed point attractors. Um, there's a lot of um, empirical indications of many different types of dynamic systems phenomena. It really um, has taken off, I think, in the last five to 10 years, and you can find many examples. This is just one from the Church and Lab where they show these kind of limit cycles which correlate with different movement patterns. Uh, but it doesn't have to be all fixed points or limit cycles. Um, you find uh, all kinds of stuff or evidence for all kinds of dynamical phenomena in the brain. Um, so this is here a, a bit more elaborated idea by Rabinovich and others um, who thought about these, uh, what they call heteroclinic channels, where you have these uh, chains of cell nodes connected by heteroclinic orbits and the whole object works like an attractor by pulling in trajectories from the vicinity uh, and that's a very flexible arrangement uh, for processing sequences for instance um, and uh, that is compatible with many observations for instance of meter stable activity uh, so this is one uh, of the results many years ago from our own group uh, Emily Balaguer at the time collaboration with Chris Lepish and Jeremy Siemens uh, we looked at this multiple item working memory task, um, details not important here, and found, for instance, that you have this typical pattern that you would expect for a heteroclinic orbit with trajectories moving in fast and then um, slowing down and then progressing fast again. So uh, I, I don't really want to dive into much detail here. I just want to um, uh, make the point that cognitive processes are commonly uh, thought of being implemented in terms of system dynamics in theoretical neuroscience. Uh, but the point is that um, we do not have direct access, of course, to the generating equations. We do have models, um, but uh, flow fields are not directly accessible. At best, we can reconstruct trajectories. Um, so dynamic system theory, um, as we have argued uh, for a while, but uh, most recently uh, here together with Quentin Huys uh, in a recent review, um, might also play a fundamental role in understanding psychiatric conditions. Um, so um, some things you can easily think of, you know, if you have certain disturbances in the system dynamics, you would expect certain symptoms. For instance, uh, if you have overly strong attractor states, um, as indicated by this cartoon here of a um, um, potential landscape, then if you are in an auditory area, you might get stuff like tinnitus, if you have an auditory percept that you cannot pull out of the attractor state anymore. If you move to a frontal areas, you might get something like rumination, these ongoing sequences of thoughts in uh, depression, for instance, you might expand compulsivity by similar dynamic mechanisms. Uh, motor stereotypies are pretty common in psychiatric conditions or changes in cortical oscillations. 
At the other extreme, if you have too weak attractable landscapes, for instance, you might get incoherent thought as you cannot hold on to a mental concept anymore. Uh, in, in the extreme case, you might get hallucinations as uh, representations tend to pop out spontaneously, uh, attention deficits, obviously. Um, and uh, another important point, I think, are bifurcations. Um, bifurcations, I think, have uh, been pretty well established by now in epilepsy. Um, but they might also, they, they, they are probably a likely explanation in my mind, for instance, the sudden onset or offset of symptoms. Um, I also think it's important to note that uh, dynamic systems um, theory can serve as sort of a hub as a central layer of convergence in the sense that many different changes at the biophysical level might give rise to very similar changes in attractor dynamics and uh, in turn, similar changes in attractor dynamics in very different brain areas, as I um, just tried to um, um, illustrate in some examples, might give rise to very different symptoms. So that's important or very important in our minds because that uh, might have fundamental implications for treatment because it basically tells you what you need to do is to change the system dynamics. Um, and that doesn't uh, necessarily entail that you need to sort of um, reverse the same biophysical uh, properties that gave rise to the change in system dynamics in the first place. It might also explain comorbidities, yeah, because if you have a general systems dynamical change in the brain, um, then um, it might lead to a number of different uh, symptoms uh, depending on the brain areas affected. So uh, now let me move on. So this is basically just a brief introduction uh, why we think this is very important. So uh, what we want to do is identify dynamic systems directly from time series observations. And uh, what we want to use, um, um, our backbone are recurrent neural networks as they are used in machine learning. Um, they are by now, I think, the standard tool in machine learning for processing any type of time series information. Uh, so, for instance, in language, natural language processing, or in um, uh, monitoring video streams. Um, so, for instance, if you have uh, Alexa uh, or a Siri that is usually recurrent neural network behind it. Um, for us, it's uh, important that these are uh, dynamically universal. So, you can approximate arbitrarily closely the flow field of any other dynamic system. Uh, and that is based on two ingredients, the universal approximation theorem, uh, dating back to say Banco and Funashi, and then you can reshape that as a recurrent neural network. So the type of system we are working with are these so-called piecewise linear recurrent neural network. Um, ZT is my neural state vector. A is a matrix of autoregression weights. W is a connectivity matrix. Phi is my rectified linear uh, unit. That is my piecewise linear um, transfer function. Uh, and this year, uh, C um, um, is a weight matrix for external inputs and H is bias term. So why are we using that? Uh, you might argue that, um, that there's at least a sort of modest physiological motivation. So in our hands, we often found that, for instance, um, uh, input output curves of uh, layer five pyramidal cells or fast packing interneurons in a physiological regime are pretty linear. And also this whole thing here has sort of an interpretation of a um, neural population model. Uh, more importantly, um, many properties in these systems can be accessed analytically. So you can uh, compute fixed points, limit cycles, and their stability, for instance. Moreover, you um, can translate. So this is a discrete time dynamical system, um, at, as recurrent neural networks and machine learning commonly are. Um, but they can easily be transferred or not easily, but under many conditions, we can transfer them in ODE systems. That is in um, uh, ordinary differential equation systems, which come with flow fields and a lot of analysis tools uh, that make it easier to analyze the system. And um, perhaps one of the most important points is um, these allow for highly efficient inference. So um, one of the caveats, though, with these recurrent neural networks, as I just illustrate them in, 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 um, in this vanilla form, is um, that they have a problem with the so-called exploding vanishing gradient uh, during training. So this is um, one of the machine learning benchmarks that has often been used 
to probe that uh, specific problem, the so-called addition problem, uh, dating back to a paper by Hochreiter and schmidt Um So the idea is um, you have two series of inputs to your recurrent neural network. One is uh, just random numbers between zero and one, uh, and the other um, are indicator bits. And the job of the network is to um, spit out in the end the sum of um, those random numbers that have been highlighted by the indicator bits. Now, of course, the network doesn't know it. Uh, it has to learn that by training. And you can make the problem challenging by increasing the time lag between the um, between the different numbers that needs to uh, need to be added up. So the classical solution proposed by Hofreiter and Schmidhuber, and still one of the gold standards in the field, are these so-called long short-term memory networks. Um, they are sort of engineered systems um, to solve the problem. They have these linear memory units which can hang on to any state that you uh, basically uh, pump in there. And then they have these controlled input gates and output gates uh, to let information flow in or out. Now, um, what we want to do, because we are interested in dynamical systems reconstruction, we wanted to keep the simplicity, uh, simplicity of these, uh, the mathematical simplicity of the recurrent neural networks, uh, the, uh, um, um, the vanilla form of these, um, but still want to uh, sort of um, solve that problem. And uh, for that, uh, we basically changed, uh, we added certain regularization terms to the uh, optimization function. So um, first, as a reminder, A is a diagonal matrix. And now if you briefly blend out these second terms, then obviously if this would be an identity matrix, then the network would simply uh, perform the identity operation. That is, it would keep any value uh, that you put in indefinitely. So that's the basic idea. The basic idea is to push part of the memory units to this um, identity configuration. So we push part of the um, of our autoregressive matrix to diagonal one entries and the corresponding W um, entries to zero um, entries so that these units by optimization um, during training would become uh, to function as memory units. Uh, but of course, we do, not, um, do that only for some fraction of all units because we want to uh, keep the other units free for doing whatever com computation um, we want to uh, or any task we want to um, perform. So that's the basic idea. Um, and um, just um, this is just to illustrate that uh, this approach, um, um, the regularized uh, piecewise linear recurrent neural network can indeed outperform many other methods, including LSTMs on a range of benchmark problems, just illustrating two of them here. A multiplication problem is the same as addition, uh, only with multiplication, obviously. Um, so the bottom line at this point is um, that we have the um, designed to recurrent neural network uh, with a simple tractable mathematical structure, yet performance um, that is um, at least on par with LSTMs. Okay, um, so line attractors are not only good for um, solving the memory problem, but they can also um, realize arbitrary time constants if I um, in my system if I detune them only slightly. So that's a, a, another thing we have published on already 20 years ago or so, um, and which we will use later on, a property which we will use later on. Um, also, this is just to illustrate that um, if we translate now our systems in continuous time, uh, you can derive these continuous flow fields and you actually um, can um, derive a lot of insight on how your uh, recurrent neural network solves the task. So this is for the addition problem and you can see that it basically integrates the inputs and then it stores the outcomes on the line attractor dimension. Okay, now uh, let's go, uh, let's move one step further. So uh, we'll now embed these systems into a generative framework. So the idea is, uh, we'll have an underlying latent hidden process that is my dynamics. We'll have some observations uh, which um, which are produced by my internal dynamics and we might have some internal stimuli and we now model this whole system uh, as a generative model that is as a joint probability distribution over these latent states and my observations. And uh, once we have retrieved this um, um, uh, this latent dynamics that you hope, then we can do all this fancy stuff like, uh, for instance, um, deriving flow fields um, and attractive states and so on. 
Okay, so um, uh, for the um, latent dynamical model, I use my generic dynamic systems model that I just introduced, the piecewise linear recurrent network. And then the idea is to couple that to some observation model that describes the specific modality uh, we are dealing with. In fact, we'll uh, embed that now into a whole framework. You can um, um, couple the same latent um, recurrent neural network model to a whole variety of different observation models, um, which um, capture the different probability distributions of my different observations. So that's briefly illustrated here. So each of these might follow a different probability distribution and might be conditioned in different ways on my latent model. My latent model is my piecewise linear recurrent neural network. Now with the Gaussian error term or equivalently um, with the conditional Gaussian distribution uh, where the mean is given by my uh, recurrent neural network formulation. And then the idea is, um, so we'll have for that uh, Bayesian variation inference algorithms in place and also expectation maximization algorithms by which we then, uh, from all the measured modalities that we simultaneously observe, uh, infer the latent states and or the system parameters. And once we have that, we can analyze uh, the recurrent neural networks using the other tools that we have developed. So uh, let me um, 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 give you one specific example. So um, we assume that we have some underlying dynamic systems. So for instance, the famous Lorentz weather system, which um, uh, creates this uh, famous butterfly um, uh, ring fly um, structure, um, the chaotic Lorentz um, um, attractor and irregular time series. Um, so that's my underlying system, but of course, empirically, we don't know the system. We assume we have only access to noisy uh, trajectories or samples, time series samples from that system. So what we do in the first step is we infer our recurrent neural network model from these time series data. Then the idea is um, let's forget about the data. Once we have um, trained our model on these data, um, let's generate new trajectories from that model. And what we want to have is, and that's here is a real training example, that our model reproduces the actual attractor geometry in state space and the same temporal structure as the original time series. So it's a generative model. Once I have trained it, I can sample from it, and the sample should have the same statistical properties as the original data. And because of it's chaotic, it won't precisely overlap, but just have the same temporal structure. Okay, so um, another highly important point in our context is um, that often as a metric, if people in machine learning evaluate the systems, they test your prediction error. But uh, prediction errors on time series uh, might not be the best statistics to use if you are in a chaotic regime. So um, these are just two trajectories drawn from the same Lorentz system with slightly different initial conditions. And of course, because this is a chaotic um, um, system, you will have exponential divergence at some point. Yeah, so the time series won't agree anymore. So that's trivial. Um, people in nonlinear dynamics know that for a while, um, but um, because of that, uh, we thought of different metrics um, we'll take as one important metric in our case, the kubak leibler divergence between the true distribution in observation space or projected into the latent space and the generated distribution of our observations given my um, uh, um, simulated latent states. Yeah, So this is a generated uh, distribution from the model. So this gives an example where you will have relatively high mean squared error because the time series do not overlap, but um, the attractor geometries uh, um, agree very well. And this gives another example where our um, reconstructed system captures the basic frequency of the Lorentz attractor quite well. And for that uh, reason, the mean squared error is actually not that bad, but it does a lousy job in capturing the attractor geometry. So we think that's a very highly important distinction if you want to reconstruct, if you are really after the underlying nonlinear dynamic system. Okay, so um, this here is just another benchmark, uh, which uh, um, is supposed to um, show that you can do that now with uh, multimodal data. So it's, uh, again, the uh, Lorentz attractor, but in this case, we uh, made the observations really noisy or we kicked out dimensions. Um, but instead, we assign class labels to different orphans. So um, the multimodal system has um, access to these class labels as well. 
And this is just to show um, that basically our approach uh, works and can also use categorical information to uh, infer something about the underlying dynamic system. So um, this comes back to a point that I made earlier on um, the slow time scales in the system. So this is an example of a, a biophysical bursting neuron model where we have very different time scales. We have these slow oscillations that define my bursting behavior and we have these highly, um, these very fast spikes. And actually, if you train these piecewise linear recurrent neural networks in this generative model context that I have illustrated, uh, you see that it actually does a fairly good job um, on, on this quite challenging problem. And uh, we could also show that this regularization, this line character regularization that I um, introduced earlier um, has a significant contribution to that. So if you if we increase the regularization parameter here, the tau, then you get a lower Kuba glider divergence and that affects mainly the slow frequencies. Uh, so in which, um, um, you, you have these uh, slower signals um, that develop on longer time scales um, going on. Okay, so now um, to the last part, uh, applications in psychiatry. Um, in this case, we want to infer a piecewise linear recurrent neural network generative model from fMRI observations. So we have an observation model that takes the hemodynamic response filtering into account. Um, so this is an example from um, tasks that Florian Wiener has run uh, at that time in Andreas Marlinberg's group. Um, it's sort of a human version of this radial arm maze that I uh, have briefly shown earlier. Uh, so it's a mutable item working memory task. Again, um, I, I don't want to go into the details. Uh, people have to remember some stuff, then there's a delay, and then they have to recall it. Um, so this here gives a glimpse of an internal representation of a recurrent neural network trained on fMRI data from human subjects. Um, so what we found not that trivial, at least we didn't get that as easily with other uh, more conventional dimensionality reduction techniques is that uh, you can see that um, trajectories in these um, retrieved state spaces um, seem to venture into different regions uh, depending on the task period the subjects are currently in. Okay, so this is just uh, some examples of uh, observed and predicted both signals. Also our generative models, and I emphasize again, we, um, we do not fit the data, we'll generate new trajectories from the model and then we'll investigate them. We simulate the model after training. Um, and um, this just shows, for instance, that the model can retrieve um, major frequency bands of the power spectrum um, that you have in the fMRI, for instance. Well, we also find that there are a lot of interesting uh, nonlinear dynamical phenomena going on. So for instance, um, uh, this is an example from a subject where we found these three coexisting limit cycles of different complexity. Sometimes we find limit cycles and chaotic attractors or other multistability between other dynamical objects. Um, they have various relations to behavior. Um, so this is just one example where we found, for instance, that um, uh, on the x-axis here, you have behavioral performance. So if the behavioral performance is high, you usually get less stable states and more unstable states, which seems to in indicate um, that higher state space complexity uh, somehow is correlated with better performance um, on this task. Um, now, uh, let me give you one more specific example um, for schizophrenia. So this Florian Bena has run this task also with schizophrenics and with healthy controls. As I told you in the beginning, you can analyze um, these models partly analytically. So for instance, you can access all the fixed points and their eigenvalue spectrum. Um, and um, so this here sh shows histogram of the maximum absolute eigenvalue for controls and schizophrenics. And just uh, as a reminder, if they cluster around one, uh, then you are around neutral stability. You are sort of in the vicinity of a stable node. Uh, but as they go above one, you have an unstable node or repeller. Um, that um, you can still have limit cycles and other stuff, of course. Um, but uh, what we observed is interestingly that you have this significant uh, change in the uh, histogram of um, eigenvalues. 
Um, and that seems to be correlated, um, seems to be rooted in the fact that uh, once we inferred the connectivity matrices, um, we found in, in this piecewise linear recurrent neural networks that both the inhibitory and the excitatory weights are usually much higher in schizophrenics than in healthy controls. And that fits very well with the less stability because that's uh, if, 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 if all the matrix and uh, matrix entries are high in magnitude, you would expect um, larger oscillations and less stability. And uh, this is just to show that uh, both the negative and the positive weights also correlate with, for instance, the uh, uh, PANS uh, psychopathology scale. So I don't want to emphasize overemphasize these data. Um, uh, at this point, it's still preliminary, but it sort of illustrates what you can do uh, with these types of models and this type of approach. So with that, I'm at the end. So my take-homes, um, I um, gave you some arguments why I think dynamic system theory um, is sort of a central layer um, for connecting neural and behavioral phenomena. Um, I talked uh, quite a bit about our framework um, um, of generative recurrent neural networks and how they enable reconstruction of the underlying nonlinear dynamic system. And what I haven't talked that much about is, uh, um, I just gave a bit of a glimpse, is how you can use it for diagnosis or um, you can also use it for, once you have estimated such a model, once you have it in place, you can also use it for simulation of interventions, for instance. And with that, I wanna um, thank all my collaborators, uh, in this case, mainly Heike Tost, Florian Bena, Andreas Marlindberg, um, uh, people from our group, uh, Georgia Copper has done all the fMRI analysis. Dominic Schmidt and Feline Bommer um, have worked on the machine learning examples that I have illustrated today. And the algorithmic part, Sarah Monferrat uh, worked uh, as a mathematician, worked more on the mathematical analysis and our funders, German Science Foundation and uh, BNBF. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel. So we have uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, let me go get them. Okay, so the first one, uh, let me see. Okay, so given the dramatic non-stationarity of neural systems, perhaps attractors are not the best metaphor. What alternative ways of thinking might there be in terms of, uh, in, for example, activity flow, sinfire chains, avalanches? So, um, in, so um, attractors are not a metaphor. There are mathematical phenomena that you get under certain conditions. Um, and um, uh, synfire chains are, uh, might be explained by these heteroclinic channels. I don't think, you know, necessarily of attractors. It could be transient dynamics. I'm perfectly happy with this. Um, I actually find this idea of heteroclinic channels and orbits quite attractive so it doesn't you know i'm not sold out on that you really need to have um stable tractor states yeah and and the the um methodology we develop can retrieve any of these up it really gives you the flow fit yeah so whatever attractors you have in there thanks so uh the next question is is there a proof of concept that with a small or unexpected not mainstream change in the dynamics of a psychiatric disease we can actually change the outcome for a patient i i think that's too early yeah so i at least from our point of view i think we are uh, we, we are right now in the process of applying that to um, different uh, to brain data from uh, different psychiatric conditions or to smartphone data but uh, i think that's too early to say Perhaps one more thing on the non-stationarity. Um, the model accounts for non-stationarity in the parameters as well. So I can model the transitions, you mean, or...? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, transitions you also get without non-stationarity. If you move to, uh, between different attractor states, for instance, or if you have, uh, like, heteroclinic channels, then you have transients, right? Um, those you can get even without non-stationarity. Um, but uh, non-stationarity is accounted for in, in uh, some formulations of our models explicitly as variations in parameters. So the next question is, are there any hypotheses based on these ideas that could demonstrate how medications, for example, ADD, could affect the strength of an attractor state? In other words, any ideas on how this could bridge back to the biology that instantiates these dynamical systems? 
That is um, that is our idea, right? So that's where we want to get to. Uh, we want to um, once we have ex extracted these models, we want to use them to simulate different conditions and from those predict uh, potentially the most efficient uh, medications. Um, but again, I, I, I really should emphasize. Uh, uh, took a while to develop this methodology. We are now at the stage only beginning um, to apply it to different psychiatric conditions. Okay, I still have a couple of more. So, uh, so, so the next one is uh, using the techniques you mentioned, can we integrate different modalities of data, for example, neuroimaging and behavioral data in order yeah. to capture the dynamics of a psychiatric disease more realistically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's a, um, that's the framework that I illustrated in in the center. So what we have developed is this tool that you can the, um, uh, that you can couple the same latent dynamic systems models to multiple uh, modality specific observation models. Uh, and so you, if you have simultaneously observed data, um, then you can couple them to the same latent model. Thanks. So uh, next question is, uh, are recurrent neural networks superior to time delay embeddings for attractor reconstruction? Is uh, time delay, are time delay embeddings old news now? So time delay embeddings don't give you the flow field, right? They don't give you a model, they don't give you equations, they don't give you a flow field. They, they only allow you to, um, to sort of um, retrieve the attracting object for an empirically observed trajectory. Our goal is to have the generating equations uh, so we can analyze them in detail and to have the whole flow field and to have basically the whole space even if the um, if they are not completely covered by my experimentally observed trajectory. So that's the main point here. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I have one more question. And that is how are the latent variables identified by RNN related to different related to or different from those by other math methods like ICA or energy landscape analysis? So it, again, ICA won't give you a model and won't give you a flow field. Yeah, so it, it gives you a model, but it's a linear. Uh, so it's a, it's nonlinear in the inference, but it's a it's a linear projection. Uh, matrix so it's it's it, it will not produce it's not a time series model it, it's not a dynamical model it won't give you dynamics thanks uh so so that was the end of the questions and, and thanks again very much for the interesting talk um and so and so uh, uh okay so so we'll move to the next speaker and i just wanted to remind everybody that um we have that google doc for further discussion so i will post the link again in case people want to add there. And now I'll invite uh, uh, Gunnar again, and hopefully this time it, it will be possible to view his screen properly. Let me see. Okay. Okay, I invited uh, Gunnar. Okay, we can see your video uh, in, in your sound. Can you tell? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. You and can we can see me? the screen now. You can see the screen. This is the right. most promising so far. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, you see something just white now? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, great, but, uh, but then I start. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for giving me a third shot at uh, making this work. Uh, I hope I can make up for it by having an interesting presentation. And uh, I will talk about uh, a concept uh, uh, which is M4 health in the brain. And M4 health can mean models for health, but it's also a specific type of models that we are doing. So it's mechanistic models, so typically ordinary differential equation, or uh, and then multi-level, multi-time scale, um, and multi-species models. And we create these models by um, 
uh, basically laying the puzzle of, in general, the human body, but here specifically the brain. Uh, so we sort how to how to combine different pieces of knowledge, data, and prior knowledge uh, into multi-level models, incorporating uh, all of the main organs in the body, uh, and and this should be useful for uh, for medical professionals, for drug development. We collaborate with AstraZeneca, and for general people that just want to keep track of their health or improve their health. And uh, I will talk about uh, primarily something called the neurovascular coupling, uh, but I will also in the end talk about how we connect this to the, uh, to the whole body level, which is uh, a digital twins, so computer copies of a person which is the basis of a, of a spin-off company that we formed as well. Uh, and, uh, and the name of this is Sederus, uh, is Sund, which is the last part of my name, which means healthy, uh, or that you do something in a sound way. So it's the same word as sound in English. Uh, primarily, I'm employed at Linköping University, uh, which actually is not famous for very much, but we are the most popular university in the world among students. We've been ranked one. Uh, number one uh, across all 5,000 universities that were um, that were uh, uh, involved, uh, and uh, and much of the of the things I would present here is actually done by students. Uh, and if the logotype uh, for our spin-off company if, is up here to the right, the the logotype for our our research group is down here to to the to down to the right. Uh, and it has two symbols, which basically combine the two previous talks. Um, so, uh, or or is sort of a commentary on the on, on the two previous talks. So we do mechanistic modeling, meaning that you can see inside what happens. Uh, but we also keep track of which parts of the model that can be well determined. Uh, so, given the available data. Uh, and in fact, we combine our mechanistic models uh, with machine learning models to have hybrid models. So this is a sort of one slide summary of my presentation. And now let's dive into some more details. Uh, so um, short history of um, modeling of biological systems in general. Uh, Hodgkin-Huxley models, uh, modeling the electrophysiology of um, uh, electrophysiologically active cells, uh, which uh, has, for instance, been a part now of multi-level models uh, in the heart, which also are connected to blood flow, but also in the brain, uh, neural networks, uh, which can be physiologically based. And uh, in, for instance, Mark Sager's baby X, uh, it's connected to an actual physiological baby that can interact with you, that can learn to recognize you, that cries if you are making it upset and so on. So both of these are very cool, but they aren't really connected with each other. Uh, and one of the primary ways of connecting them is the neurovascular coupling. So how does the blood flow that comes to the brain, how is that altered by brain activity? Uh, and the neurovascular coupling is uh, also important because it is the basis of fMRI and NIRS data which typically are analyzed by uh, quantifying each voxel in, in, in these type of images to get this type of time series. And then you do a correlation analysis with an archetypical shape of uh, uh, the, the bold response, which is the signal that you measure. Uh, and if you have a high correlation, you get the, uh, an, an active area. And if you have a low correlation, you, have a, uh, you say that there is no activity in this part of the brain, in this voxel. And the problem with this is that this ignores all of the known biology. Um, and uh, what we propose here is to instead have a mechanistic model that describes the processes involved. And then by fitting the model to data for the bold response, but also to many other things, you can make predictions. And this can give you a much more nuanced and versatile and reliable activity measurement and also other things than activity. But to do this, we need to develop a reliable model for the neurovascular coupling. And this is what I will talk about now, today. Um, uh, and the way we do this is uh, by uh, taking experimental data and mechanistic uh, hypotheses, formulating them as ordinary differential equations or, or as uh, differential algebraic equations. And then either we reject the hypothesis because they can't explain the data, 
Uh, or uh, if they can explain the data, uh, we always test the model a couple of times more by doing predictions. And then we uh, save some data or ideally collect new data, uh, which are done as a basis of these predictions. And only if the model can correctly predict new data do we say that it has some merit, and then we incorporate it into the big picture, which we then use for things in the clinic or for drug development and so on. And in the beginning, of course, you need to have a, a, a model for the big picture. And for the neurovascular coupling, we'll essentially put this big picture first, and then we'll fill in more details after a while. Uh, so coming then to this neurovascular coupling, um, or the fMRI signal. Uh, the first belief of how this works was that it, that it involves a negative feedback. So the reason why the signal goes up is that uh, it first goes down. So first you have a nerve activity, which leads to metabolism, which leads to uh, increased blood flow, which then so, uh, brings in new glucose and new oxygen and so on. Uh, but lately, uh, another hypothesis uh, has, uh, has replaced this one from the 80s, the original hypothesis, which is a feed-forward hypothesis, which says that this is not acting as a control system in, in a terms of a feedback loop, but as a feed-forward signal, where you have nerve activity, which just kicks, kickstarts a system, which then just runs its course. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been proposed for around 10 years, approximately. Uh, but neither of these hypotheses had pre previously been tested with modeling. So this is what we did using our approach. Uh, so we formulated first a negative feedback hypothesis. Uh, and uh, while it could describe the data, while it could produce this archetypical shape, so here you have actual data, which are, which are the different error bars here. And the simulation with such a model is the line here. So you see, it, it has a good agreement with data. But when you look at predictions, they are widely unrealistic. Uh, so for instance, here, uh, glucose is the controlled variable, and then glucose goes down to zero for several seconds. And, uh, and this is not what happens, even though we can't measure it with a high accuracy, we know that it doesn't behave like this. And then when we thought a little bit more about it, we realized that, well, this is actually what is to be expected of the control system. So if the control system kicks in because the system initially moves down before, because you consume glucose and oxygen, uh, then what would happen uh, is that it, it brings it up, but then once it is up above basal, it would go down again. Uh, and here you don't see that, you see this extreme overcompensation uh, and then it leads to a sort of post-peak undershoot as well. And this is, uh, while maybe the post-peak undershoot would be expected, a complete overcompensation is not how a control system typically works. It's much more of a positive feedback. Um, and uh, uh, in the end we included uh, the, the metabolism in the um, uh, in the model. So this is the biology simplified, and here is the mathematical model. So each uh, box here represents a state in the differential equations. Um, and we published this in 2016 for the positive bold response, which is the one I showed you. Uh, but uh, the, the year after, we modified the model to also be able to describe something called the negative bold response. And this we, the, we did by adding the variable GABA, which leads to inhibition on the electrophysiological level. And in both these papers, we validated the model by experimentally testing predictions of the model. So we'll see what happens in new experiments. So this is agreement of the model with training data for the positive bold response. Again, the simulation is the blue line and the data are the different error bars and for the negative bold response, which uh, is here to the right. Uh, and then we saw uh, what happens if you, for, for instance, add a second stimulation. You show the, 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 per, the person's a second white circle with a certain time delay. Then the prediction is that it, it will instead look something like this, which was validated by new experiments that we did afterwards. And the same was true for all the other things that, I'm, that I will show you. Um, so this basically uh, argues that there is a positive uh, feed-forward uh, cascade going on, uh, but that just says sort of on a phenomenological level what happens. If you want to dive into the biology, we need to move from humans to animals, because there you can do much more in terms of unraveling the mechanisms.
But the problem with animals is that they are typically, uh, or they are often under anesthetics. And then the question is, what does anesthesia do? So we needed to sort that out first. And there are different hypotheses. One is that it uh, alters the neuronal activity, and another is that it also has effects on the neurovascular intracellular uh, processes. So we we uh, we uh, we uh, identified some data for this and formulated a more physiologically based models for these different arms, these different feed forward arms. So here we have pyramidal cells and two interneurons, um, and. Um, and uh, and then we, we have these type of data and and what you also can do in animals especially in mice and rats is that you can do something called optogenetics uh, which is um, where you genetically modify the animal uh, to be able to use uh, light laser to uh, to uh, excite only a specific cell type and only in a specific part of the of the brain so you can be very selective in what you activate and then by inhibiting crosstalk you can sort of also not have secondary effects or you can have it and you can compare it also with sensory uh, uh, activation. Um, and all of these things give rise to different types of responses. You, you alter this bold response which is here approximated by the dilation of the arterioles, so the small arteries. And you see that sometimes you have a longer post-peak undershoot, sometimes you don't have it at all, the amplitudes are different, and so on. Uh, so we developed a, a model for these data. Uh, here you have the, the three cell types again. Here you have the electrical activity, and here you have the control of the diameter of the arterioles. Uh, and then we did it in the same way as before. We trained the model to, to some data. Uh, so experimental data, uh, uncertainty are the error bars here, and the best model simulation is the red curve. So we had lots of estimation data for all these different conditions, stimulating some cell types, not others, allowing for crosstalk, not having crosstalk, and so on. And then once we had trained the data and said that this is probably how it works, we tested it by adding validation data. And again, here you see comparison between the model predictions, which is the envelope, and the data, which are the error bars here. And you see that the model can correctly predict new data. So then we had a, a sort of explanation for this data and for these different conditions. Then we could look into the model and see how can you produce all of these different behaviors. And uh, this prolonged post-peak undershoot where it stays below baseline for a long time in certain conditions, this could be explained by something as simple as, um, as a michaelis menten expression. And the basic idea is that you can translate a, a large difference in uh, an upstream signal. Uh, so here you have a large amplitude difference where the high amplitude also is high for a longer period of time. You can translate that via a michaelis benton step to something which has the same dynamics difference, uh, but which has removed the amplitude difference. So here you have a much longer response, but the amplitudes are essentially the same. And this was what in the model allowed for uh, this behavior. So on the positive arm, so there were these two arms, here's the positive arm, you basically see no differences between the two conditions, but for the negative arm, that one that was involved in the post-peak undershoot, uh, that one has this behavior where you have a big amplitude difference, uh, which leads uh, with some time delays um, to a, a, also timing difference, and which then, via this michaelis menten step, uh, leads to time length difference only. And this is why this one goes down to lower values, but it doesn't go uh, oh, for, for longer time, but it doesn't go down to lower values. So in this way, we can sort of use simulations to unravel the mechanisms and then test predictions. So it's a way to sort of combine biological experiments with hypothesis testing in a systematic way where you can keep track of many very complicated processes. So negative arm goes on for longer. Uh, and what we have done uh, also is that we have um, uh, gone beyond this model uh, to um, uh, one that describes all sorts of other data. So not only this optogenetics data and the ordinary bold response, but all sorts of other data from primates, from humans, from rodents, uh, 
Uh, optogenetics, local field potential, också hemoglobin, det är också hemoglobin, total hemoglobin count, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and the bold. So we have a single model that can describe data from all of these, from humans, rodents, and primates. And here is an overview of the model. Here we have the pyramidal cells, the two interneurons, and here we have control of the arterials, which then propagates using a blood flow model, which keeps track of the physics, essentially. And then we have the bold signal, which is another type of model, which is basically an MRI model. Uh, and this is, to our knowledge, the first model that can describe all of these different things. So there are some different previous models that you see here, but they can explain parts of these. They can, some can explain intracellular mechanisms, but not other things and so on. But our final model can explain all of these different uh, type, of, type of processes, all of these different types of data. And, uh, and this allows us, again, to explain all of these complicated behaviors by looking into the model. So here we can see if you go from a short stimulus to a long stimulus, you can uh, uh, go from a one-peak response to a two-peak response. The first peak is explained by the NO interneurons, the, the, this uh, uh, one of the interneurons here. Uh, and uh, the second piece, peak is explained by the pyramidal cells, and the, and the post-peak undershoot, uh, undershoot is, is explained by the NPY interneurons. Uh, so we're also doing all sorts of other uh, uh, projects uh, in the neurofield, which I'm not talking about now because of lack of time. So we have, we are connecting our neurovascular coupling models with more detailed electrophysiological models to explain also other data, EEG and MEG and so on. Uh, we are looking at social medicine analysis to look at stress and other risk factors. Thought processes uh, according to think aloud protocols where patients are are basically saying what they are thinking and then we monitor both bodily functions and um, and and uh, neuronal activity in, in in different ways and we are describing then the thought processes combined with the physiology uh, stroke we're doing quite a lot of uh, facilitation which is an intracellular process involved in epilepsy uh, metabolism and um, and also we are moving more and more to uh, interconnected models where we have different brain areas. Um, but let me talk shortly here in the end about uh, how we connect this to the whole body level. So this is our patient zero, the first patient that we did a patient-specific multi-level whole body model for. So we put him in, him in an MRI and we measured um, uh, fat content and muscle content, uh, blood sugar meal responses. So here you see comparison between data and simulations. Again, we subdivide the data by estimation, so the lunch is the estimation, and then the dinner response, uh, which is the second, is the validation, where we test the model, and then we do predictions with uncertainty. Uh, this model that uh, is actually approved by the FDA as a replacement for animal experiments when uh, certifying certain insulin pumps. Um, heart and blood flow models, uh, uh, brain activity, stress responses, exercise, and so on. All of this has gone into the same multi-level, multi-organ model, which we are now moving towards testing in the clinic for better pedagogics, personalized diagnosis, better compliance and prevention. This technology, which is also part of our spin-off company, uh, was launched uh, last year and that led to keynotes in, in, in various places. And if you want to see more of this, here is a YouTube link. Um, but just as a... Um, and here is our first prototype of an interface. So here you can uh, choose. So now the, 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 the model for this patient zero is in, the, in, uh, in behind. You can choose which organ to look at. So here we pick the brain, and then you can choose all sorts of different aspects to look at. Now we pick the bold signal. And uh, you can choose to look at the, uh, at the blood, any blood vessel in the whole body. Um, and uh, here we pick a blood vessel which is uh, which is uh, close to the um, which is located in the brain. Um, and um, and then you you basically decide what do you want to simulate for this digital twin of this patient zero. Uh, and here we simulate something simple, but what which is connected to my first slide. So it's it's uh, just some heartbeats uh, and some brain activity. Uh, and then once you have um, once you have specified here to the right what you want to uh, what you want to do what you want to simulate, uh, then you can um, uh, push play. It's sent to a backend where all the simulations are uh, are being performed uh, and where the digital twin is stored. Uh, and then you get um, 
simulations out. Uh, hopefully here. Uh, well, I don't know why it stopped. A bit. Yeah, okay. So here is the bold signal, uh, which is very similar to data we have. Uh, but uh, but we also have um, uh, blood flow and so on. Somehow something happened with the, with the video. But all of this is on the YouTube link that I showed you. So you can see all sorts of performances. So uh, to sum up here, we um, uh, have this technology, um, uh, which we now are publishing uh, and uh, making public so others can use it. Uh, and um, a new version of the software is being released soon. And we will test it in the clinic next year for preventive measures uh, first, and then for various patient groups like type 2 diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure. Um, so to sum up, uh, I presented this concept, M4 Health, mechanistic, multi-level, whole body down to intracellular, multi-time scale, short time scale, milliseconds to years, and multi-species models of the brain and the body. Uh, we have modeled the neurovascular couplings in a more comprehensive way than according to what we know any other group has done. Uh, and this can be used to bridge electrophysiology to fMRI and provide improved merging analysis with a wider variety of different brain measurements. Uh, and this is part of a new digital twin technology where uh, you can combine models and data and knowledge from a wide variety of things and uh, just some acknowledgement. So the main part of this work has been done by Sebastian that I presented now, uh, but we uh, are collaborating with many different collaborators. So this was my research group. These are the collaborators. Uh, here is some of the funding. Uh, here are some of the p key people in the, in the brain modeling. And uh, this is our schedule for how to do the analysis uh, or how to do our collaborations. So that was it for my presentation. Thanks very much. That was an impressive amount of different systems integrated and scales I've ever seen. Uh, uh, so we have a question from the audience. The, the first question is, what level of anatomical structural details are these models, uh, do these models use and are they able to use? And what are the rationales for the choices made? Uh, so for the... For the brain, we don't have anything of that at the moment. So we only describe what happens in the voxel. Uh, so it's, it, we sort of assume that this is a well-mixed compartment. Uh, but what we want to do now and what we are setting up collaborations with anybody that we can find uh, is people who, who have more whole brain models um, and, uh, and that describes communication with different brain areas. Uh, for some of the other organs, we have a much more uh, high resolution anatomical description. So for the liver and for the heart and so on, there are much more uh, widely developed models included. And you mentioned cross species models too, modeling across different species. Do you have fMRI for which, which animals do you have for? Uh, we have fMRI for uh, uh, rodents, humans and um, monkeys, mm -hmm. so primates. Um, and uh, it's it's not our data it's it's it's, it's our collaborators uh, data or just published uh, publicly available data thanks uh, so we have another question uh, what about glia cells uh, signals from glial cells would it be meaningful to to include that in the model yeah we had it we have we have, we have had it in some versions of the model with um, um, uh, we don't have it in this model because we don't need it, but uh, in principle we could have it. And for the metabolism, it's more important. Thanks. Oh, okay, so uh, I don't see other questions. Uh, Bill, do you have a... Uh... Oh, you're muted. Oh. Hmm. Having trouble unmuting. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so thank you to all the speakers, uh, and thank you, Gunnar. Uh, so we're going to have a lunch break until 2.45 p.m., and after that, uh, the, the talks will continue uh, at the same URL. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.